Perfect. Well, thank you so much for everyone to take the time today. I, I really appreciate that so many of you are, are, you know, online and so many familiar faces and names on the list. Uh, I really appreciate this. Um, as as uh, Alexander already said, CEP is an organization that looks both at the operational side uh, of online behavior of extremists and terrorist groups, as well as uh, counterterrorism financing measures. And we um, just did a little bit of research at the beginning of this year, uh, where we looked at the combined issue, i.e. the terrorism financing by misusing social media applications. Now, certainly the adoption of new technologies by terrorists is not a really new issue. Um, even Al-Qaeda um, uh, uh, figured out the pleasures of using email accounts uh, before 2001. And of course, in 2014, with the advent of ISIL and the growing of, of this horrible organization, you could see very clearly how they moved into new technologies, in particular also social media and internet communications capabilities. That's been widely discussed. One aspect, uh, however, that was uh, uh, receiving less attention in the last few years um, was uh, the counterterrorism financing aspect of this. Obviously, the horrific uh, uh, beheading videos, the bomb-making manuals that were uh, uh, you know, in full view on, on major platforms, that gathered the attention. Underlying these, however, was also a, a deliberate attempt um, of these groups to use the communication tools that uh, social media uh, does afford everyone um, in order to finance themselves. Um, this has been documented a couple of times, and I just see that in my point there's an eight missing. So the US National Risk Assessment in 2018, in case you're wondering when that was, the latest one highlights that uh, social media is actively misused uh, for counterterrorism financing purposes, not only by ISIL, but also by Al-Shabaab, which is an ISIL affiliate and the major terror group in Somalia, AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, the APG MENA FATF uh, issued a typology report in 2019 where they looked through the way that uh, you know, terror groups go about misusing these, um, these services. Um, clearly what uh, the message from all of these documents is, is that it's mainly used for fundraising campaigns, which is obviously the mainstay um, of any terrorist organization, regardless how large they are, even in the heyday where ISIL was pumping oil in Iraq and Syria, they were still actively fundraising um, all over the world. Um, these fundraising campaigns um, obviously are mainly done by disseminating financial information, i.e. calls for donations, disseminating bank account numbers, or you know, go to this uh, uh, you know, website to donate money for us. Um, that's, therefore, the good news on this issue is that so far, most of these campaigns were highly visible, i.e. clearly recognizable uh, online, and did not yet involve any sophisticated encryption tools, which makes sense because you want to reach a lot of potential sympathizers and donors as a terrorist organization and not make it very complicated for your information to be found. Um, so therefore, it should be, the countermeasures should be easier. Crowdfunding websites, of course, are a particular at risk because, as I said, fundraising is one of the main stakes for terrorist organizations to finance themselves. And crowdfunding websites are exactly built for that purpose. Uh, already in 2015, the European Securities and Market Authority said that crowdfunding platforms should be particularly careful and run a very tight due diligence on anyone that, um, that uh, does a fundraising campaign on them in order to make sure that they're not misused by terrorists. Um, unfortunately, so far the experience was that if fundraising campaigns have been discovered by crowdfunding platforms, the investigations always run into a problem because even the platform really didn't have the information who actually did those fundraising campaigns. So we do really have an, an effort for them to be misused, uh, these, these uh, services, and we have a problem still on how to act and prevent this misuse. There really, in, in anything a social media platform wants to guide, there are really two ways to figure out what's going on for them. On the one hand, they can recognize they have users on their platform that have a nefarious background, i.e., they can recognize that there are terror financiers on their platform being active. The other one uh, defense mechanism is that you look at what's going on on your platform independent of a particular user and see whether you can find patterns that may be pointing towards nefarious purpose. Both require, however, that platform actually prioritize the issue, in this case, terrorism finance, and look actively for that. And the major tool here for the recognizing of the activities is what is depending on the platform called rules or terms of service or community standards. 
it's basically the document that says to all users, if you want to use our services, this is what you are okay to do. Uh, this is what you're not okay to do. Um, so it clearly outlines where platforms are going to prioritize what they're looking for. Now, at the beginning of this year, we um, at CEP really did very basic tests of both um, uh, uh, defense mechanisms. The first one, recognizing that there are tire finances on your platform. We basically, and this is the reason why uh, we asked Edmund and, and Jackie to join us today. We looked at the very same list that Edmund, Jackie, and their colleagues are uh, managing with the Security Council, the ISIL uh, and Al-Qaeda sanctions list. This is the only global list that there is. This is the only global list that is legally binding for all member states because it's passed on the Chapter 7, it's part of the United Nations Security Council sanctions list, and it presents somewhat of a global consensus that the individuals and groups that are on that list, and there's around 300 and 80 plus, it changes, as Edmund says, through uh, review processes uh, fairly frequently. Um, but these 380 plus, the world community um, is in a consensus that these are indeed terrorists and not freedom fighters. Um, there is a subset in that list. Um, if you go through the, and this is how the data fields look like, there is a subset of those individuals. This is just the first three names on that list. Um, that is clearly marked in publicly in that list as is involved in financing of ISIL or is involved in financing of Al-Qaeda or an affiliate of both organizations or is a phony charity that works for ISIL, Al-Qaeda or those uh, um, affiliated entities that belong to that wider network. And what we've done, we simply extracted those and it's about 40, uh, uh, I think 42 uh, list entries, as they call these data fields, the individual called list entries, 42 of those, uh, and said, okay, let's see if we can find those on any major platform. So what we've done is we did a very simple manual search, not because we don't have sophisticated tools. CEP has developed eClip, which is a, a software that works on hashing and this enables the, uh, the user to refine uh, picture sounds and videos on the platform, but we wanted to make it as simple as possible to make sure that it's not a massive technological hurdle to recognize that these individuals and entities may be on, uh, online. We also only used the data that was provided publicly, and you can look at that list on the United Nations Security Council website, that's provided publicly, but to make sure that there don't, doesn't need to be any massive sophisticated uh, information gathering operation in order to find those profiles. So with those two limitations, manual search, and, uh, uh, and only the data that is publicly available, we identified about a dozen profiles, uh, a couple of individuals, a couple of, of organizations, with the data uh, at one point, even the precise address uh, that is mentioned in the Security Council sanctions list as being connected to these individuals and notified the platforms. Um, obviously, they reacted very quickly. Facebook, for example, removed all the profiles uh, pretty much a couple of days after we notified. YouTube, uh, a couple of weeks later, blocked one video. The others weren't quite as responsive. You will see all the details uh, in the press release. Um, uh, here is a picture of the press release. There will be a policy paper being issued following this event where you will have also the link to the press release um, of this. So obviously, um, as far as the most public, the most notorious counterterrorism finance is concerned, um, our test showed that there is uh, room for improvement on the defensive mechanisms on these platforms. The second thing we did is we looked at a very interesting report, and I'm very grateful that Tom Keating, who is one of the co-authors of this report um, in 2019, has made. So just to explain the, the role of this report and why we looked at it, um, this report was done um, for the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism, GIFCT, an uh, organization that in 2017 was founded by the big four, so Twitter, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, um, to counter the misuse of their platforms. And there is a global research network on, on uh, technology and terrorism, on terrorism and technology that is part of this network. Um, and that research network asked, tasked UC to write them a report on what is the risk of us, our platforms being misused, and what can we do? Uh, and uh, Tom and his colleague made uh, quite a few very helpful recommendations, but we just took the very basic one that he made. He said, please could you adjust your terms of services, community guidelines, standards, rules, whatever you want to call, to make clear that you are not accepting counterterrorism financing. Now, we went back uh, in March 2020 
checked um, the platforms that were mentioned in the report in their terms of service or community standards um, and checked a couple of additional ones. And unfortunately, there hasn't seemed to be an adjustment of, of the formulation. So some even exclude um, um, money laundering uh, from, their, uh, from their platforms. Um, normally in the compliance world, those who work in counterterrorism financing or compliance of any kind know that the usual acronym is AMLCFT, any money laundering, counterterrorism financing. It really is always seen as a combination of a problem or a challenge. Uh, so while they took, understood the counterterrorism, uh, the, the money laundering part, apparently the counterterrorism financing part has not really caught their attention. So um, we also checked uh, beyond the report, uh, the five largest crowdfunding platforms by users uh, at the moment, at not, not one of them, unfortunately, is uh, excluding counterterrorism financing from their services. I'm not saying they want uh, to have counterterrorism finance activities all going on. They just uh, seem not to focus this as a priority area in their content monitoring. Um, some of the platforms simply say, please keep the laws in the country that um, you are acting with as our user, which is nice, um, but I don't think that terrorists are uh, particularly law abiding. Um, the second uh, uh, subgroup of crowdfunding platforms simply say, um, if you are convicted of terrorist offenses, then we will not accept you as a user. Um, unfortunately, there's no information how a global crowdfunding platform could check each individual user um, if they have a counterterrorism financing conviction. And I do not think that users are willing to share that information when they sign up for a funding uh, 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 adventure at those platforms. So there is still gaps that can be closed. Therefore, we make um, two very simple recommendations for the platforms, as you can imagine. Number one, please, could you proactively at least search for those terrorism finances on your platform that are publicly known? There is the UN list, there is the US list, there is the European uh, counterterrorism list, at least for those who are already identified, which is obviously not everyone, but at least those who are having you know, public naming and shaming by, by international organizations or major governments, it would be great if they would not be on your platform. Uh, the current uh, uh, system where CEP essentially um, comes up with a, a small research idea, does a little bit of manual search and then notifies you, is really not a sufficient defense mechanism in our view. Um, neither we at CEP nor, nor anyone else that we know in the uh, um, civil society space has the budget, the mandate or the manpower to uh, constantly Google or search uh, major social media platforms for potential profiles of uh, counterterrorism finances, uh, but the platforms do have the user data. So if the data sets of, of uh, counterterrorism finances match with your users, maybe it would be worth having an, another look at those users. Um, the second recommendation is following also from Keating's paper, again, the call for please extend, uh, uh, amend your terms of services, community standards or rules uh, to explicitly exclude counterterrorism financing. There is in our view, no business case for not excluding this kind of things. 100% none of these platforms are happy if counterterrorism financing going on. So please say so in your community guidelines and focus therefore your internal monitoring services, either automated or manual uh, 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 human moderation, also on these issues. The, the thing is, the usual argument is if um, the, the major platforms become inhospitable to terrorists, they would go to smaller platforms. This is obviously true, and it has happened in the past. For counterterrorism financing, this means a significant reduction in uh, uh, finances of global networks like Iceland and Al-Qaeda in their ability to act. They need the broadest possible um, uh, public outreach, and a platform with a billion users is better than a platform with a thousand users. So yes, they may migrate to, to smaller platforms, but in that case, that is actually already a major impact on their ability to raise funds. So please, if you could explicitly exclude this and focus your internal mechanisms, develop some expertise on what's going on in the counterterrorism uh, field, uh, financing field, and uh, try to start moderating this, this would be a quick win and a quick help. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, crowdfunding platforms, because they're specifically set up to raise funds, um, is uh, a particular vulnerable here. 
just a segue to a, another report that's coming out in mid-March. We will have an event on the 18th, uh, in mid-May. We have an event on the 18th of May, where we look at the misuse of cryptocurrencies and terrorism financing together with the Adenauer Foundation's New York office. Um, that, uh, there we will also talk about the misuse of fundraising, um, but then in connection with cryptocurrencies. This is my short presentation, so I'm looking forward to your questions.